uh, what a better way to start the day than to have a very um, young dynamic uh, influencer with us here for the first plenary. I, it's my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Gaurav uh, Sharma uh, from um, Dr. Gaurav Sharma is a member of parliament in, uh, in the New Zealand assembly. Um, and to give you a short introduction, uh, he's volunteering to a work as a caregiver in a rest, uh, rest home inspired Dr. Sharma to pursue a career in medicine. And that's why the doctor, uh, Dr. Sharma upon qualifying as a doctor from University of Auckland became involved with the New Zealand Medical Student Association. Here, he has been a proactive mentor and contributor to the next generation of doctors. He's also the recipient of prestigious Fulbright Scholarship which funded his MBA at the George Washington University in DC, USA. He became a senator and contributed to the GWU Student Senate and also spearheaded Hillary Clinton's campaign on university campaign, campus, sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Varush Sharma. We have a very wide time zone difference between here and New Zealand, <laughs> and it's probably the end of your weekend. Um, um, not a really good time to be talking serious stuff, but we are so glad that you could make it and you're here with us. Um, really looking forward to hearing from you. Also, please let us know how to, you know, um, because you are a you're an influencer, uh, you are talking about, you are, you're going beyond the mandate and you're talking about serious climate stuff. I mean, um, it's really important that we have, um, you know, young leaders like you um, taking on the mantle. So do talk about how do you, you know, what are the strategies that you employ to engage youth and other people who are not listening to youth? And also what are your views on the COP26? It's very important that we talk about that as well. Thank you, and over to you. Uh, kia ora and namaste from, uh, from Hamilton, New Zealand. Uh, I know it's the start of the day for you guys. It's 4.40 p.m. for me. Um, and unfortunately, I do have to run to a, a TV interview right after this. Um, but I'm just going to start by saying, Inga mana, inga reo, inga roranga tirama, tena koto, tena tatu katua. Uh, ko inga Himalayas, ki India o ku maonga tuatahi, uh, ingari ko pirongia te maonga i nai nai, uh, ko satluchi toku awa tuatahi, ingari ko Waikato te awa i nai nai, uh, ke Frankton kirikiriroa toku kainga i nai nai, uh, ko Sharma toku Fano, ko Gorov toku ingwa, uh, ko ayo te mema paremata, mo kirikiriroa ki te uru, uh, no ku te onere, te tu ke mua e koto, uh, uh, so this was just a way of uh, a Maori introduction uh, from my side to you guys. And, and you know, it's, it's a tradition in New Zealand uh, to start uh, by basically uh, telling people where they come from. So, you know, people talk about uh, what is their mountain, what is their river, uh, you know, uh, what land they come from, just talking about giving people a bit of an idea of where they're coming from. And I think uh, that is really important when we uh, talk about climate change, because we've got to talk about, you know, what it is that we're coming from, what things have we done, what things have we not done, and where are we heading? Uh, so that's why I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction uh, in Tereo. Uh, and also, you know, uh, in some of the sessions that I've seen uh, from, uh, from the sustainability conference, we talked about, you know, indigenous voices. Uh, and, you know, Māori being the, the, the people of the land in, in New Zealand, I just really wanted to acknowledge them uh, and their work as well and their involvement in this climate change debate. Um, in addition to that, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank SES. I want to thank Strout, uh, Manviji, Anuragji, Ananji, uh, and also want to acknowledge Sumeraji and all the work she's doing. I know she's speaking after me. Uh, and the incredible amount of work she's done with the WAS uh, in bringing multiple issues uh, you know, um, and raising those unheard voices. Uh, thank you to you guys uh, for, for uh, doing this big conference. You know, logistically, it's very difficult to get people from all different parts of India, not just different parts of the world. And just before when I was talking, uh, you know, I heard about how you volunteers are based in Orissa, they're based in Karnataka, 
uh, you know, Delhi, different parts of India. So, you know, it's really good to see people coming together uh, from all around India and all around uh, the world to talk about this very serious issue. Uh, even though it's the end of the weekend, uh, you know, there's never a bad time to talk about serious issues like this. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the uh, Indian Sign Language interpreters. Uh, Saurav, I think I saw uh, Gargi's name, and uh, there was another person I saw. I uh, can't remember their name now. Uh, but you know, it's really good to see, uh, you know, that inclusivity uh, of people uh, in this conversation as well. Uh, I was told that they're members of the LGBT uh, QI community as well. And again, you know, because climate change affects all of us, it's important that we take everybody with us. Uh, and there is representation from different sectors uh, on board. Um, I was briefly saying before that I'm the co-chair of PCAL, uh, which is the Parliamentary Champions uh, for Accessibility Legislation in New Zealand. And it is a cross-party group. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, the bills that come through Parliament in New Zealand uh, have um, a focus on accessibility. So it's really good to see, you know, that we do have um, sign language interpreters on this call as well. And I really want to thank you for, for doing that um, as well. Now, um, you know, talking about climate change, um, as we come together this week, uh, so to have the, the world leaders who've convened uh, for the COP26 in Glasgow. And thankfully for the most part, you know, we moved on from a time where climate change uh, itself uh, was being questioned uh, to a period now where we must all be held to account uh, over both our ambition uh, and our action. Uh, we do have a lot of work to do, uh, but I remain incredibly proud uh, to be part of a government that has done a lot of work, uh, at least in the Asia Pacific region, uh, to help mitigate the risks uh, of climate change. Uh, but a lot of it has been born out of necessity. Uh, and I just wanted to share some of the things, you know, that we're doing in New Zealand, because I think one of the important part of uh, this discourse is um, that we share ideas, uh, you know, that we talk about what's working well in one part of the world uh, and, you know, what ideas we can exchange. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, that any of these ideas are the only way to do things, uh, but I just wanted to share some of the work that has been done uh, in New Zealand around this. Um, so the first thing was, you know, around building the foundation uh, for this climate change debate. Uh, the first thing we did was we declared a climate emergency uh, in New Zealand Parliament. Uh, we passed the landmark Zero Carbon Act, and we became one of the first countries to put the one and a half uh, degrees Celsius global warming uh, threshold into uh, parliamentary legislation uh, in the primary legislation. Uh, we also established an independent climate change commission, uh, which sets out our emission budgets, and the first three have already been uh, set out for the future. Uh, we also took uh, quite an important decision uh, that we were going to end any new offshore oil and gas uh, exploration. Uh, we overhauled the whole uh, emission trading scheme uh, and we put a lid on uh, emissions for the first time uh, in the history of, um, you know, in our government. Um, now we're taking the next steps. So uh, we want to be ambitious. Uh, we've set a goal for 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And we're investing in this initiative um, to help us, uh, you know, get there. And we want our public sector to be carbon neutral by 2025. And we're setting up the programs to get there too. So uh, we started to replace the entire government fleet uh, with zero emission vehicles. Uh, we are helping uh, different cities uh, and city councils to help change their fleet of buses uh, to make them zero emission. Uh, we started planting a billion trees and we've invested in a new fund, uh, a 1.2 billion fund uh, called Jobs for Nature. Uh, and this is basically around, uh, you know, sinking carbon costs and basically just making sure that uh, there are new jobs in helping um, uh, with, with, uh, with climate change issues uh, and, you know, moving away from some of the other capitalist jobs that we've had for quite a long time, which have been adding to the climate change problem. But our biggest problem uh, lies in the fact that, you know, we we produce food, we process it, and the way we get around it. And that's why we've invested in research uh, to reduce agricultural methane. Uh, we became the first country in the world to legislate for a price on agricultural emissions. And we're currently building the world's only farm level emission measurement, management and pricing system. Uh, and it's why, um, you know, uh, we've also increased the public transport spending by 40%. Uh, we've introduced a new clean car standard and incentivize low and no emission vehicles. Uh, recently, the government announced that, you know, if you wanted to buy a, a petrol car, for example, you would have to pay an extra tax of up to $8,000. Uh, 
while if you were to buy an electric vehicle, you would get an $8,000 um, you know, uh, discount on it. So it, it became a, a scheme where, you know, in a way, the, the, the petrol cars were in, um, basically being taxed and the electric vehicles weren't being taxed. So there wasn't an additional need of uh, money from government, but it was a, a We invest billions of dollars now into buses, trains, cycling, walking infrastructure, which hasn't been the case historically uh, in New Zealand. Uh, we, we're now investing in uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure all around the country. Uh, we brought in a vehicle emission standards for new imports for the first time in New Zealand history. So before what used to happen was, you know, a lot of countries would dump their old petrol cars in New Zealand. Uh, and there was no sort of standard uh, of to which you could hold people accountable when they were importing these cars. Uh, we brought back the mandate to include biofuels in petrol. Um, we're still using it. We're still going to be using cars for, you know, petrol cars for years to come. But we need to make sure, you know, that it's done in a way we are, where we are decreasing our, um, you know, footprint uh, on the climate. Uh, but I would also like to say that, you know, uh, while there are some areas like transport where we are catching up with the rest of the government, that there are areas where we are leading. Um, you know, we are the first country in the world to pass a law that would ensure that all financial organizations disclose and ultimately act on climate related risks and opportunities. And that we continue to be a leading advocate internationally for the removal of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, we set up a new energy research center uh, to look at hydrogen economy uh, in the same place where, you know, the offshore oil and gas mining was um, restricted recently uh, that I talked to you about. Uh, we're helping businesses to switch to clean energy with the government investing in decarbonizing industry fund. Uh, we started placing our own coal boilers uh, in schools, hospitals, universities with clean alternatives. Um, there's now a new uh, minimum build standard for new um, houses that are being built by the government. Sorry, Dr. Um, Shama, we'll... I missed that last one. And one request, if you could just be a little slow. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, I guess we were just talking about... Uh, yes. So what happened is we replaced our coal boilers uh, in schools, hospitals, and universities. Um, with clean alternatives, uh, and also the houses that are being built by the government, uh, there is a, a whole new um, clean standard on how these houses are built. Uh, we're cutting down emissions from building and construction. Uh, rather, Parliament itself is uh, building a new building, and we're looking at uh, various ways of uh, minimizing its uh, you know, footprint um, on the environment. We're investing in warmer Kiwi homes um, as well. Uh, because part of it is, you know, making sure that uh, the next generation of houses are ready to tackle um, changes in weather or changes in climate. In the last few weeks alone, uh, we have quadrupled our climate finance commitment uh, to the most vulnerable uh, countries by $1.3 billion uh, over four, four years, uh, which means, uh, you know, part of it is to our Pacific uh, Island countries where we've doubled our climate change aid uh, for the next four years. Uh, we've also increased our contribution to the global effort to tackle the climate change by reducing our net greenhouse emissions uh, by 50% uh, by 2030. Uh, we are introducing legislation to require all listed companies and large financial institutions uh, to report on their climate-related risks so you know where your money is going and you know what sort of impact it's having on, on the climate. Uh, but, you know, no doubt there is a long way to go. And, and I would say, you know, the issue of climate change is connected with all the 17 of the UN SDGs. Uh, before I became an MP, I was working as a medical doctor in a high needs community in Hamilton. And I saw the impact of moldy homes and bad public transport on my patient's health. I saw how both uh, mental and physical health of people was affected by issues outside of health. Um, moving forward, uh, I guess, you know, we've talked about uh, a lot of things that the government has done over the years uh, in addressing some of these things uh, across the board. But I think moving forward, two of my biggest concerns around climate change are the, the minimal research we've done around climate refugees uh, and the lack of global plan planning for um, surge capacity in healthcare systems. Uh, you know, as COVID has shown us, we as a society have instilled in our population uh, to run towards healthcare organizations at times of excessive threat uh, from whether it's man-made or natural disasters. We need to make sure that steps are taken to enhance the preparedness of the medical and public health communities uh, to any global threat uh, from climate change. 
The hospitals need to be prepared to deal with response to events uh, which go beyond the day-to-day -day operations and management of patients and diseases. Uh, the clinicians and managers that run the health system need to be equipped uh, to handle any crisis that increases the surge capacity of the hospital system. Uh, a few years ago, uh, this is when I was still uh, at medical school, and you know, and it was interesting because we were still, you know, we were talking about climate change then. We we're talking about climate change a decade on, and um, you know, I guess one of the sad things is, you know, I sometimes people will be talking about climate change two, three, four decades from now still, uh, without uh, you know, uh, firm action. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, when I was at the university, I wrote and presented a paper um, that examined climate change as a population health issue uh, for New Zealand and evaluating its potential impacts and critically appraising the existing strategies we have in place. Um, the specific paper initially canvassed this enormous um, issue uh, fully you know, in its entirety and looking at its um, impact on human health. Uh, and you know, as I talked about before, Human health is affected by, you know, threatened food supplies, re-emerging infectious diseases, poor water quality, uh, impact of extreme weather events, impaired ecosystem functioning, you know, displacement of vulnerable populations, and the loss of livelihoods. So there's a lot of things that go hand in hand uh, in impacting that human health from climate change. Uh, but what we offered was an intervention to address climate change within a population context uh, by focusing on one specific thing, and that was around migration within the Pacific. Uh, we looked at Tuvalu, you know, it's one of those countries where uh, the sea levels are rising. Uh, and, there, and there is prediction that, you know, in the next few years, uh, it will get to a point where people from Tuvalu will have to migrate to other countries to survive. And that's what I mean. We are not actually looking at these climate change refugees. We're not looking at what will happen to a um, country like Maldives, uh, you know, a country like Tuvalu, where once the sea levels rise, where will these people go? And, you know, it's very easy to uh, even say that, you know, we will take them in into New Zealand, but moving the whole population into a different country comes with its own set of um, challenges. Uh, as I talked about, you know, surge capacity is something that we really need to, um, to be looking at. Uh, it, it's just the health system, but also across the board, uh, because, you know, if we are not uh, mitigating the risks now, um, the, the climate change refugees are not too far away. Uh, and I think it is important uh, and appropriate that the national planning scenarios uh, include the surge capacity in medical and public health fields. Um, you know, otherwise, um, the outcome for climate change related health impact will be fruitless, uh, despite our blessed planning uh, and intention. Um, and, and I guess the way I would summarize it is, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, so, uh, so I think some of some of those, I guess, are some of my concerns moving forward. You know, the healthcare system and how it will deal uh, under such a threat, uh, but also what would happen to to um, climate change refugees uh, coming in from different parts of the world. Uh, one of the questions you asked me right at the starting, um, you know, was how can youth um, get involved? Um, it's been interesting to see, for me at least, you know, that the two groups of people who've been very involved in this climate change discussion are, are the ones who are either quite young. Uh, you know, in New Zealand, we had a, a school strike uh, where 170,000 students, you know, that's a big number for New Zealand, we're a population of 5 million, 170,000 students marched uh, all across the country and many of them came to, to the parliament um, to talk about, uh, you know, action that's needed on climate change. But then on the other side, uh, I've been talking to people, you know, who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and they're saying, look, uh, I want some action on this uh, because I want to leave a better world for my kids and for my grandkids. Uh, so I, if anything, I think the harder people are the ones who are in the middle, you know, people who are in their sort of mid-30s to the, the late 60s, you know, they are the ones who, who need a little bit more convincing uh, than the ones who are quite young and, and quite uh, older. Um, so, um, you know, that's what I would say is, uh, you know, at the moment, if anything, you know, our, the next generation is looking towards us uh, to solutions uh, on how we can um, address these challenges, how we are going to address these challenges. Um, and, and it's not easy because, you know, if you look at what's happening in COP26, you know, there's a lot of countries. And I mean, uh, even, even within the country, I mean, I would imagine a big country like India, you know, there's so many states and, and the impact of, uh, you know, any intervention would affect um, states differently. You know, I come from Himachal Pradesh. Uh, I was born there. It's a, it's a very different country, you know, lots of uh, trees and plants and things, but, you know, the impact might be different 
compared to somewhere like Maharashtra or you know Orissa or Karnataka, uh, because the industries are different. So so it is hard to bring that consensus across the board, even in one country. Uh, so I can imagine you know like uh, sitting there in COP26, uh, where different countries are trying to come up with with uh, with a solution is not easy. Um, but I do want to acknowledge you know the fact that world leaders are at a stage uh, where they are discussing this. Uh, and and the the voices of you know people like you your organizations are very important uh, in this discourse. Um, so thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I've literally got two minutes before my uh, interview on TV, so um, I think there's quite a few questions here as well. Would you yeah. like me to go through some of those or? Um, um, okay, so that? firstly, thank you so much. I think that was a very uh, I mean. It's uh, one thing to read it in the newspapers or other, another thing to, you know, hear it from an MP on what all New Zealand is trying to do, trying to achieve. And it's, uh, I mean, there is a lot of lot to learn there, uh, especially in terms of how you are uh, going, you know, how the strategies for industry, et cetera, are. Um, there are, okay, two, three questions here. Uh, I think um, you can combine the answers because here we are talking about two, you know, two stakeholders at the different side of spectrum. So there is industry. Um, Rahul would like to know how, you know, considering the strength of fossil fuel industry and the power they will over decision making, what are the challenges you face in implementing uh, climate change policies? And uh, on the other side, uh, Purnima Palika would, would want to know, you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, ancient knowledge with indigenous tribes of New Zealand and how how are that how is that being uh, you know utilized to tackle climate change if you have any experiences with the tribes of uh, new zealand and all yes, so yeah, yeah go ahead. sorry sorry i've only got one minute so yeah. i really have to be quick Please go ahead. and yeah. i and i apologize for that um you know when it comes to indigenous population i think one of the things as i said um, new zealand does really well is you know whether it's starting from a conversation and you know i gave that introduction right at the beginning um, to consulting on policy uh, you know, our, our uh, Maori communities are very involved in that um, discussion uh, across the board. Um, you know, we've got some really good leaders uh, within the ministry, like, you know, our cabinet is full of uh, Indigenous ministers as well, um, you know, from our foreign affairs minister, uh, Nanai Mahuta, um, to, uh, you know, we've got a, a specific minister uh, who's responsible for Maori affairs as well. So, you know, having a minister who is, who is involved in Indigenous affairs also means that their voices are heard. Uh, when it comes to, to business and other sectors, you know, obviously um, there is resistance. As I said, you know, there will always be resistance from whether it's um, different sectors or, you know, as, as we were talking, there could even be different states or different regions because their economies are affected in different ways. Um, but it is about working together. As I said, you know, we, we banned um, uh, offshore, um, you know, permits for gas uh, and oil. Uh, and, you know, in that specific region, um, there were a lot of people who were concerned, you know, about the economy, they were concerned about jobs. Um, so, as we said, you know, we're looking at the hydrogen economy, you know, so the government is doing other things there uh, to help with the job losses, to help with planning for the future, for, to help with just transition. Um, so, so all of that is part of the consultation. And I think the, the, the biggest thing here is, you know, that the main word here is, a key word is consult, consultation. That is very important across the board, whether it's on an international level uh, or whether it is on a, on a local level uh, as well. Uh, but that consensus, again, is difficult to get. Uh, and I completely acknowledge that. Um, so I guess those are my answers. I, I'm not very comprehensive and I really apologize. I do have to run away uh, for a TV interview. Um, but once again, you know, thanks so much for all the work you guys are doing. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a one-off debate. I'm sure we will continue to have these discussions on social media and other platforms as well. You know, feel free to message me. Feel free to write to me. I'm on email, email right. Facebook, yeah. uh, Instagram. Uh, but thank you for all the work you guys are doing. And, you know, maybe we can have a follow-up session from this in, in a few months' time and see where things are. Because I guess part of the thing is, you know, when, when COP26 happens, uh, everyone's focused on it and then three months later you know as with everything news cycles you just move on yeah. from it um, so hopefully maybe we can catch up after that yes, too. yes yes and if it's okay with you we can also post the comments on questions uh, or to your email address and if you have time just, just, then we'll pass it on to the yeah definitely thank you Goro. It was, thank uh, you so much. Dhanyavad, sabka dhanyavad, and we'll catch up thank you Aapka bhi bahut bahut dhanyavad. Ho hopefully to see you face to face in delhi Maybe next year. 
Bilko, we'll, we'll catch up on chai. Yeah, thank <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining us. And um, after that very um, uh, positive um, input from Dr. Gaurav Sharma, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Poonima Palikar to introduce our next, another very uh, influential and uh, experienced uh, panelist, Dr. Sethil. Thank you, Manviji. Uh, uh, and thank you very much for covering up for me because uh, I didn't realize that uh, I was late or were you early? I don't know. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was supposed to introduce uh, Dr. Sharma. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sejal Vora now. Uh, she'll be talking about the eco restoration of Jabar Khet. Um, she is a resident of Masuri and Delhi. As program director of WWF India in New Delhi, she manages a multidisciplinary team of professionals working on various facets of uh, environmental conservation and sustainable development. Prior to this, she spent over a decade conducting training and supporting participatory conservation approaches in South and Southeast Asia and in East Africa. More recently, she has migrated back to Missouri, where she has set up Uttarakhand's first private nature reserve at Jabar Khet, which aims to combine forest restoration and conservation with general uh, generation of local livelihoods and ecosystem services to demonstrate the value of nature. So uh, welcome uh, Dr. Bora, and I request you to take the stage and uh, share your valuable knowledge with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what I'll do because I know that time is always short, let me try and share my screen. Um, and then I'll take you through a presentation which will share the journey of how we uh, work towards restoring and rewilding um, a, a small patch of forest. It's, it's quite modest, but I think the story is worth, worth sharing. So give me a second while I share my screen. Can you see the screen? Is it visible? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so let me start uh, this story with, uh, with a story. Um, so Jabal Khet is, is basically a small settlement uh, outside of Masuri in Uttarakhand. And uh, this forest that you see in this picture is actually a privately owned forest. Uh, there are quite a few uh, privately owned forests in India. People may or may not know uh, because one assumes that all forests in India are owned by the government. Um, but there are actually these small patches of forest and they offer a very unique chance for conservation. Uh, and one of the things that we tried to do was to create a model uh, where private forest owners can actually be incentivized uh, to conserve their forests rather than what they're trying to do now is to sell them uh, and get them developed. So, uh, so this, is, this is a small attempt at that. Uh, let, me, let me take you on, uh, on the journey. So, so Jabal Khet, uh, you know, this, this is a small little hillock that I used to trek in and climb in when I was a child. Uh, when I was about 10 or 11, we started trekking to this area. Uh, and we used to keep coming here for picnics, hikes, etc. And then, of course, uh, you know, it was a magical place. When we are children, uh, everything, you know, outside in the forest is magical. Uh, I then went away. I left India for many years. And when I came back, uh, the first thing I did was I made a beeline uh, for this childhood uh, place of mine. Uh, and I was shocked. Uh, I was shocked to see that it had actually degraded like anything, or maybe it was already degraded, but I had no idea because as a child, I didn't know what I knew as an adult and as an environmental conservationist. Um, so I saw this, this very, very degraded and overused area. It was full of trash, uh, literally full of trash with people just coming and uh, you know, with an absentee owner, it was a typical tragedy of the commons kind of scenario where everybody did everything. Uh, and nobody really cared about the place. Uh, it was overrun with weeds. So this is a weed called Eupatorium. Those of you who know the Himalayas know uh, how pernicious this weed is and it takes over everything. Uh, there were cattle grazing everywhere, you know, uncontrolled, uh, which, you know, affected the regeneration of the area. There was massive lopping. Uh, again, those of you who have traveled in the Himalayas know uh, that oak trees are often lopped a lot, but here we started seeing lopping of rhododendron, 
of all kinds of trees. So it was uh, pretty uncontrolled use. Uh, there was cutting of trees uh, going on rampantly because there was no one to check what's happening. Uh, the usual firewood collection, of course, by the local communities and hunting. So just about everything that could happen to an unused or uncared for uh, forest was happening in this place. And it was very clear that unless somebody did something, it was a slow and terminal decline um, of the area. And of course, this is just outside. So just a kilometer away, this is what the hillside looks like. And one of the things that I was kind of determined to do is to not let the same fate uh, befall the hillside of Jabakhet. So that's why we started this model. Uh, so, so that was the case, you know, the, the case was made for me as far as I was concerned that, you know, I had spent, um, you know, more than a decade training other people in how to do conservation. It was time for me to try and do my own, um, you know, real action conservation on the ground and demonstrate what I was talking about. So we started very modestly. Um, what the first thing to do was I had to find the owner of this place and convince him to set aside uh, over 100 acres of his land for conservation. Of course, that was not easy. Um, the person uh, who owns this place is a businessman from Bombay. Uh, trying to convince him about the value of conservation obviously was, was a challenge, but somehow uh, that worked. Um, and uh, he essentially said, okay, fine, set it up, uh, but set it up as a business model because otherwise it will not be sustainable. And that was probably the best advice he gave me. Uh, and he said, I will give you five years to prove that this model works. So that was the challenge in, in front of me to, to set this up and, and make it work. Uh, as a business model for conservation. So the first thing, of course, was uh, the locals. So local communities who were using the place, it took a lot of convincing, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, uh, a lot of skepticism, because really people didn't believe uh, what I was up to. They had never I thought of an idea of setting aside a place for conservation. How would it benefit them? Uh, you know, the current benefits in terms of grazing, firewood, grass collection, all of that would go away. Uh, what would they get in return? So we had many discussions about this and, and how to balance uh, basically sustainable use uh, and the fact that they would actually benefit more uh, if this place was conserved rather than if it was left as it was or indeed sold off to somebody else who would cut off their access completely. So, so that took a while. Of course, we had, uh, you know, <laughs> we had instances where people were so upset with us, they would break our fence, they would break our walls. Uh, they would write horrible things about us. So the first year was was a real challenge uh, where we were just trying to, and you know, these fences are, are simply, uh, you know, notional. They're not there to stop anybody, but just to give an indication. And we, we actually don't have a fence around the reserve. Today, it's just social fencing uh, that, is, that is protecting the area. We then started the restoration. So uh, we started restoring the springs, the water sources uh, in the area. We removed about 800 kilos of trash. As I said, the hillside was filled with trash. So we were busily removing trash. We removed uh, several tons of weeds of Eupatorium to try and create areas where restoration was possible, where natural grasses and vegetation could come back. Uh, we made a few small water holes uh, for wildlife because there's actually no water except the spring, which is very, was very disturbed in those days. So we basically started creating a little mini habitat uh, undisturbed habitat for wildlife because a lot of the wildlife in this area uh, had disappeared and we were hoping that it would uh, come back if we created uh, the right habitat. We also started a training program for, for guides. So we trained local boys uh, to become nature guides uh, and to employ them in the reserve. We also generated employment for the women. So one of the first uh, employees of the reserve were the local women uh, who helped us with the management and, and caretaking of the reserve. Uh, and, and in return also controlled and managed the grazing and, and the firewood collection. We didn't stop anything, but we were just trying to regulate it, manage it and zone it. Uh, then we started our first trails. So, so the idea, the model that we had in mind was that we would create uh, nature trails and we would have these uh, local boys take people on na guided nature walks uh, and we would charge tourists for it. And that money that was generated would sustain the reserve, pay the salaries of the staff, and hopefully create a small corpus, uh, which would make this, uh, this whole model sustainable. Uh, of course, people laughed at me when I first said that and said, it's never gonna work, uh, because why would anybody pay to go for a walk? They can go for a walk anywhere in Missouri. Uh, you'll have to have residents, you'll have to have campsites, you'll have to have uh, you know, some accommodation, selling stuff, and I just refused because our model was about restoration. It wasn't about uh, tourism. 
so uh, so we we resisted all that and said no we will give this a try uh, and we created a network of nine or ten trails um, and and we trained up uh, these these youngsters and and we kicked off with these initial walks what happened uh, so that was the vision um, it's been now five years since we opened the reserve and uh, of course our water sources are now flowing perennially and one of the things we're doing is looking at the discharge volume and seeing if we can even start looking at a small cess uh, because this entire forest is protecting the water source of uh, the entire cantonment of Missouri, uh, one side of Missouri. So we are toying with the idea of looking at uh, how we can get people to um, sort of value the, the ecosystem services that are created by this forest. Uh, our trails are no longer full of trash, uh, but they're actually uh, very beautiful in different seasons of the year. Um, surprisingly enough, people are incredibly happy to come and walk on these trails and pay for it. Uh, so when people said nobody will pay to come on your trails, uh, that proved to be completely wrong. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the people who come are incredibly happy with the experience, even though it's just a walk with, with our guides. And the recovery has been uh, remarkable, you know, the, the removing the pressure. And this is one thing in India that, uh, you know, our ecosystems are so productive that if you just remove the intense pressure that they're under, they will bounce back fairly quickly. So as the grazing got controlled, um, as the use got controlled, we started seeing uh, Um, the, the forest canopy, as you can see from what you saw, a lopped, degraded canopy. We are now seeing a lush, uh, you know, this is about 10 years of protection and uh, the, the forest is coming back to life. Um, and then, of course, we started seeing the wildlife coming back. I used this picture. This was my first uh, leopard picture in a camera trap. Um, and he posed for us so nicely in the evening light. Uh, and I was thrilled when I saw this. Of course, now uh, we have hundreds of these. So I'm not so, so excited anymore. I'm always excited, but not as excited. But this was, this was our first sign that um, the wildlife was moving back. So what did we learn? I wanted to share with you in, in a quick uh, overview the lessons, because that is to me the most important thing. Many people ask me how they can replicate this model. Uh, so I just want to talk about those two or three or four things that I thought uh, were, were also lessons for me uh, along the journey. So one is that, you know, we are small, but we're not insignificant. Uh, so initially when I started this, you know, 110 acres, uh, I thought, you know, what is 110 acres? It's nothing, you know, in the scheme of things. But actually when you add these small bits of forest up, uh, they make a significant difference. And we recognize that Jabarkhet is making a difference because we're starting to see it uh, not only as a refuge for disturbed forests around and for animals to come in, but also to look at north-south connectivity. We are starting to see wildlife here uh, that is normally found in the plains. Uh, so animals are moving all the way up from Rajaji, um, you know, to, to Jabarkhet. And as climate change, and you were just talking about climate change in the previous section, uh, as climate change intensifies, these connectivities are going to be critical. Uh, these sort of core zones, these stepping stones are going to be very important for wildlife. Uh, to be able to move uh, from areas of stress to areas of less stress. So, so that was my first lesson is that that small is not insignificant. We are playing a pretty significant role in the overall ecology and the ecosystem of the area. Uh, this, by the way, is just an example of the kind of little refuges that we have created in the forest, um, you know, where we provide food, water, shelter, uh, and that's what brings wildlife back. Uh, we've started documenting our, our flora and fauna, and, and again, as I said, it's small, but we've got over 70 varieties of ferns in this small area. We've got over 100 varieties of fungi and mushrooms in this area. Um, we've got about 400 species of vascular plants and flowering herbs in the area. Uh, and we've got about 160 bird species uh, that we've documented in this area. So. So again, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing what you can conserve and protect uh, even in a small patch of forest. And then, as I said, we started, you know, initially we started seeing the nocturnal animals uh, come out in our cameras. You see a civet, you see porcupines, but on the right-hand side, what's interesting is much rarer species. So jungle cats at 8,000 feet, um, quite unusual to see that. Uh, foxes, you know, coming back, the Himalayan fox coming back after a long time. I hadn't seen it in decades. Um, and, and suddenly we started seeing foxes in our, in our cameras. 
And then what was again uh, more interesting as time moved on and the animals probably felt more secure or the place was, was getting discovered, I don't know. Uh, we started seeing a lot of wildlife in daylight. Um, so, so initially it was, it was them coming out at night, but increasingly in our cameras and even on our walks, uh, we started seeing um, wildlife in, in, in daylight. Uh, that was obviously a barking deer. This is a gural. We have a very healthy gural population in the park. Um, that's a leopard cat. Again, in broad daylight, generally you don't see leopard cats in the daytime, um, but we see them. And this picture is, is particularly interesting for me because as this leopard cat was coming to the water hole, just across the meadow where you see the trees was the inauguration of the reserve. Uh, and we had about 100 people there with media and forest department ministers, all kind of making all this racket. And this cat was just across uh, casually moving across the, the meadow. So, uh, so that was a nice omen for me. Uh, as I said, uh, leopards moving around in daytime, uh, increasingly, all, I mean, pretty much all the time. Uh, we, have, we have camera traps on the trails and often we see that, uh, you know, a group has just walked uh, and two or three minutes later, a leopard walks on the same trail. So essentially they're watching us, they're keeping their distance uh, and they're using the same habitats. We've had no conflict so far, touch wood. Um, and one of the things I'm also trying to prove with this model is, is the fact that humans and wildlife can coexist. Uh, if you manage the area and you don't actually hunt them out, uh, there is every potential in a crowded country like India for humans and, and wildlife to coexist. We have everything using the same trails from joggers to leopards to school kids to, um, you know, villagers collecting grass to cows. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty much a free for all for everyone. Uh, Sambar, again, very unusual um, because Sambar generally gets hunted out uh, before it can reach the mountains. Uh, but again, in our little core zone, we started finding all this uh, interesting wildlife which had not been documented for a long time. Uh, very interesting interactions between different species. Uh, so we are seeing all kinds of interaction between gural and langurs, uh, between co-class pheasant and, and barking deer. Uh, I'm actually still waiting for somebody to come and do some interesting wildlife studies here. Uh, if there are any takers, please let me know, because unfortunately our reserve is too small to be exciting um, and people want to do all the, the big stuff, uh, but there's lots of really interesting things to do here. Uh, and, and then finally, just to say, Anand, you've got your hand up. Is it, am I out of time? Uh, no, no, that, that was for saying. I will come and do the research. Oh, okay. <laughs> Volunteer already. <laughs> okay. So, and then finally, I just want to end with, with the other interesting and exciting. So as you know, these are, these are successive pictures as time goes on. As I said, initially, uh, nighttime, then daytime, uh, then we started seeing breeding. And, and of course, that was also very exciting. So we've started now seeing breeding of, of all kinds of uh, critters over there and all kinds of wildlife. This is obviously a gorilla with a young, uh, that's a barking deer with a young. Uh, that's a wild boar with little piglets. Um, that's a leopard cat with kittens. Uh, and excitingly, that's a bear with a cub. Um, so, uh, and again, you know, we were told that bears have been wiped out from this area for a very long time. Uh, but we started getting bears on our cameras. And when we tried to explore why, uh, we found the link, and this is how nature works, is that once we controlled the lopping and the acorns came back on the oak trees, uh, that attracted the bears back. Um, and then, of course, as we removed the, the, the weeds and the grasses came back, the, the herbivores came back and the leopards came back. So, so we've seen this, you know, in front of our eyes, we've seen the recovery uh, of this little patch of forest. Uh, this picture I like because you see the lights of Masuri in the background. Um, and, and here's a bear, you know, just roaming on the hill across the town. Um, again, a very, very interesting model in terms of looking at coexistence, where if you manage, uh, manage an area well, uh, probably wildlife and people will be able to keep their keep their spaces and, and still live side by side. Um, I like this picture because it looks like this leopard is really having a good time. Uh, again, this is just across. Across this is, is the town of Masuri. Um, the other lesson I think that that is that, as I mentioned, is that resource use and recovery can work together. We haven't stopped. As I said, we haven't stopped use of the forest. We still, uh, everybody still comes in uh, they collect the resources, but it's how you do it uh, and how you manage it and, and how the, the users also respect the rules themselves because they see the value of this forest. This has now created its own economy. So people sort of value the forest and therefore are much more uh, respectful and also, also warn us if other people and outsiders are coming in. 
Uh, sometimes you do get outsiders coming in and, and the locals will immediately either stop them or warn us or tell them that this forest is actually being protected. Um, and this is just, again, an example of, of recovery. You know, as I said, Indian forests, you see that on the left, this tree has probably been lopped and lopped and hacked uh, for, for many, 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 many decades. Uh, but once you leave it alone, it starts coming back to life. Uh, and this is what we are seeing all over the forest. We are seeing these signs of recovery uh, of trees that have been hacked for, for decades, uh, finally finding a new lease of life. And, and I can't tell you how happy it makes me to see uh, this recovery of, of these, uh, these trees. And of course, the vegetation, as you see, you see the ground vegetation and the ground orchids coming back um, on the trails. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to. Um, and, and so this was again the other lesson, right? The values can be varied. So the local community, as I said, uh, the picture on the top left, these are the local dhabas. Uh, and, and they've all now you know, upgraded themselves. They've made little homestays. Uh, people in these dhabas who used to wash dishes are now actually birders uh, and are taking people on birding trails. So there's been a transformation of the economy and also the skills and the jobs that people are getting. When I first started, you know, the, the parents of these young boys uh, were wondering what I was up to, you know, where is she taking them? What is this? You know, she's put binoculars around their neck and she's taking them into the forest. Uh, what is she doing with our kids? Uh, and, and that skepticism today has completely transformed and they're coming to me and saying, you know, can my boy also come and work with you? Can you train him as well? Can he get a job? Um, so, so there's been a transformation in, in the whole mindset of, of the people as well, uh, where conservation now suddenly becomes uh, something that they value. Uh, again, uh, no major funding. Uh, we've done this entirely on our own. Uh, I put in a bit of money, the owner put in a bit of money. Uh, and as I said, he asked me to make it viable in five years. We actually broke even in three years, um, except for Corona, which kind of set us back and we are back to square one. But I think we'll, we'll recover again. When we opened, we got the forest minister and the local sort of MLA and all that to come and do the opening because we do need their support. Uh, but that was it. After that, we've, we've not asked for any government support uh, since then. Uh, we've been kind of managing it and running it on our own. Media was important. Uh, so obviously we got the media in and uh, we talked about the pride of having this place. Um, you know, a lot of people felt felt good. Even the re local residents felt good because they were on the map. People knew about it. And now, of course, it's among the top five destinations in Missouri. Um, so, so there's been a lot of transformation in terms of just creating a new kind of model uh, for tourism. But the biggest transformation for me has been has been these young boys. Uh, this is Virendra when he started on the left. He was he was a young kid. Uh, we trained him. He had no idea about nature, conservation, birding. Uh, this is him today on the right. He's a, he's a hep guy. He's everybody's asking for him. He's on Instagram. He's, you know, people from all over the world are asking for Viru to go birding with. Uh, he's a fantastic bird photographer. Um, and, and several young boys are now sort of following his steps. So he's become like a role model uh, for the youngsters in the area. And, uh, and Viru said a very interesting thing when I first, uh, when I hired him, he got a national award in the second year that he started working with us. He got the Sanctuary Award for Best Nature Guide. Um, and he was flown to Mumbai. He had never stepped out of his village in his life. Uh, he went very confidently, took the award, came back and, and said to me, you know, so Viru used to walk nine kilometers a day uh, to go to college from his village. And he used to walk through this forest. And he said, you know, I have been walking through this forest my entire life ever since I was a child. Uh, but I was walking with my eyes closed. Now I see the forest for what it is. And, and that's, you know, that's a remarkable story of how, uh, how one person's transformation has also impacted so many other youngsters in the area. And this is where the future lies, right? So, so these are our, our local users. These are the boys uh, from the local area that we've trained. These are the women uh, who used to you know, fight with me the most and now are my biggest supporters. Uh, if there's a fire, they're the first ones to go out and try to put out the fire. Um, and then of course, that's, that's Whipple who used to be, he used to work in a restaurant uh, and today he's, uh, he's a bird guide. Uh, showing uh, showing the next generation what to what to value uh, and and so the other lesson that that I learned is everybody kept asking you know what's your plan what's your business plan what's your long term plan and and I just kept saying I don't really know um, I'll see where this journey takes me and we'll evolve as we go along 
And so one of the things I learned is that maybe vision and passion is as important as having a really good plan. Um, and, and so we're kind of bumbling along. Uh, we don't know what the next step is. We're now thinking about converting this area into a, a training center for more people and more youngsters in Uttarakhand to set up similar things in their villages. Um, so we are, we are toying around with a number of different ideas, but really it's, it's a journey and we're kind of take, you know, letting us take us uh, where it goes. Thank you. That's, that's all I had to say. A quick, uh, very quick journey, but uh, I hope it was interesting. I think see, it would uh, it would not be uh, an exaggeration. I say that we all heard and a TEDx talk just now. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, Bunker Roy hit it out of the stadium the day before yesterday on the first day, and I think you've again opened the day. Of course, we had from New Zealand hills. You took us to Masuri Hills, and okay. I'm having goosebumps while talking to you. So thank you for that fantastic and inspiring story. You really have uh, taken our yin yang concept uh, to the perfect level because we were talking of depressive and really you know morbid stories earlier. That's right. That's so you've right. taken it to a, another level. Yeah. So I'll ask you a question which sure. Ankush had asked. Uh, Ankush Vengurlekar is the co-founder of uh, Adivasi Lives Matter, and he's uh, signed in from Austin, Texas. Uh, his question is that what did the businessman have to say now? Oh, <laughs> uh, so so that's interesting, you know. So initially, when uh, when I first started, and as I said, I wanted to keep it really low key. Uh, I wanted it to really be a local endeavor, which benefits local people and benefits conservation. I wasn't really interested in uh, the financial angle of it, but you know, it had to be it had to be um, sustainable in terms of finance as well. So initially, um, he was surprised uh, when we when you know we kind of started uh, actually generating an income. But then, you know, being a businessman, his idea was always, how can we make more money? Uh, so he kept pushing me and saying, you know, let's start this, let's start adventure sports, let's start a zip line, let's start mountain biking. And I kept pushing back and kept pushing back and saying, no, you know, we, we can't do this. And, and so there was this tension between us uh, for a while in the middle where, where he saw all the potential, he saw all the economic potential, whereas I was looking at it with a different, you know, with a conservation mindset. But then what happened, it's been interesting because as, as the place started getting recognition, you know, so, so not only from people like you, but there were newspaper articles, the government was getting interested in putting it into their, uh, you know, propaganda. Uh, it was recognized as an OECM from India globally. Uh, you know, all of this stuff, then his whole thing changed because suddenly the name and fame, uh, you know, and his name was in everything, right? Because he's the owner. So I always give him credit. I always made sure that I gave him credit. Uh, so that he also gets recognized. So now suddenly he's like, oh, wow, you know, what a great success story. We have to document why it's successful, this, that, and the other. So, so I think, you know, the, 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 the sort of attention that it's getting uh, has changed his mindset. And I think also for the locals, you know, this is very important from, a, uh, from the local community point of view. Um, so they are also appreciating it, you know, and I kept telling them that you should be proud of this place. Uh, you know, and this place will bring you pride. It will not only generate money for you, but it will put you on the map. Uh, and they've started recognizing that. So, so there is this sense of, you know, sense of ownership, larger ownership that has been created, uh, which I think hopefully will protect us in the long run when other threats come along, which they will. I'm in no doubt that this is not the end. I, I'm in no doubt that there will be threats um, and, and that this area and the area around it is going to be under pressure continuously. I can't hear you, you're muted. Sorry. There's a second question from Sushmita Kamat, who signed in from New York. Incidentally, uh, Long Island was hit by a tornado yesterday. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, her question was that after your success story, have people come to you with private parish pouches saying, do this to this yeah. much as well? So, so two kinds of things. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is that we are managing one side of this hill. You see this picture here, um, that's, that's on your screen. Um, so the hill that you see on the, in the foreground is actually forest land. Okay, so that is a reserve forest that belongs to the forest department. Uh, to the left of the sign is us and to the right of the sign is another owner who's the cousin of this owner who, and they don't get along with each other. Um, so my main uh, motive was to get him on board uh, and to manage this as one area because the other side is already protected. Um, so, 
so you know whenever he would talk to me whenever he would uh, come to me and he'd say i would tell him that come and join us he says no no i want to sell this land it's a liability for me i get no benefit from it i just want to sell it to a developer let the developer do what he wants uh, and that was my biggest fear so so i've been uh, kind of trying to get him on board so every time he would ask me you know once in a while he says ha huh, how's it going how's it running so i said it's going really well you know lots of people are coming it's it's fantastic just trying to get him on board and he was just skeptical interestingly uh, last year unfortunately corona happened but the year before corona uh, he came to me and he said i want to make nature trails on my side um, and i'm going to work with you to to get this side also because i now see that your you know this is actually a, a viable economic uh, alternative so i'm very excited uh, hopefully you know if that hill gets saved that's one side of it Uh, but the other thing people do come to me so people who visit you know come to me and say oh i'm in karnataka i'm in sikkim i'm here i'm there how can i set up a similar thing so you know every model is going to be unique every private conservation effort is going to be unique because in india the land tenure is very very complicated uh, so here what we've done and and it's a, it's probably not replicable is that you know initially i wanted to buy this but i couldn't i couldn't legally buy it because of the cost and this and that and you know circle rate so what we've done is we've actually set up a company So this is called Jabar Khet Eco Development Limited. It's a it's a company, and what the owner has done is he's leased the land into the company for one rupee a year. So we've essentially uh, set up a private company uh, with this land being the collateral for the company. Now this is unique, right? Because we worked out a model. Somewhere else you might buy the land. Somewhere else you might have a different agreement with the owner. Uh, you'll have to find your own kind of way around it. Uh, but everything's possible. You know, I thought this was impossible when when I first realized I couldn't buy it. i was so dejected i was like oh shit you know here goes my idea up in smoke uh, but you can work it around you know so so be creative be innovative and and find a way uh, and my belief you know my future vision is that every piece of privately owned land in india becomes a conservation area because in india today it's going to be these small patches uh, the large patches are already protected it's these small patches that we are losing without even realizing it so the more of these small patches of forest that we can protect um, you know the better for conservation and for the future of the country Uh, thank you, Sachel. That was fantastic. So I can uh, say that you ticked off so many boxes of uh, what a successful business model looks like. But you also ticked off so many conservation uh, ben benefits or what I call as ecological services. You know, uh, because the bears came back, so you have a food chain completely going on. You have the leopard cats. The predators can't come without the prey. You controlled. Predator, uh, sorry, uh, invasive beasts that are there in that area. So, in conclusion, if other people have to replicate this kind of a model, uh, just a quick line as to what were your challenges and how did you overcome them? So, I think I think my main challenge was convincing the current users uh, to understand that in the long term this will benefit them because you know when people are are poor and when they've had unrestricted access to an area. it's very hard for them to think long term uh, you know and 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 this belief that we have because we have the luxury of thinking long term they don't have the luxury of thinking long term for me probably that was the hardest challenge was to convince them to give me a chance uh, and i just said give me a chance you know i will prove to you that this will benefit you in the long term uh, that i think was the hardest part for me i showed you in the beginning the kind of challenges i had you know i mean it was it was depressing you know people were just so against me that that i really at times felt demoralized and i said how do i you know how do i convince people because it's a chicken and egg thing right until you and and so i think the the one big lesson i learned and i'm being a bit cynical here the one big lesson i learned is that money talks uh, so at the end of the day what convinced them was when the jobs and the money started flowing uh, and that was for them the transformation right oh yeah she's talking the truth look she's created jobs i've got employment money is coming more more people are coming to my dhaba my husband's taxi is being used uh, so so at the end of the day it was the economics that turned the tide for me and i i think that's an important lesson uh, for all of us to remember today that you know whatever you say at the end of the day people are aspirational uh, and if you meet the their aspirations then they will they will be on the cause with you so thank you so much and we are so glad that we you know pushed to you we know you were traveling Uh, Friday and Saturday, and yeah, we switched yeah. it to Sunday. So we're very happy to have you with us and Thanks. push so much of positivism into this discussion, into this discourse. Great. And we will share Dr. Uh, Sajid Bora's coordinates as well as of Jabarkhet with everybody. 
but definitely sustainability economy green economics uh, communities youth there's so many of the check boxes that you've covered over here and of course biodiversity and conservation and i think i think it partly worked because it was small uh, you know we do these giant yes. projects on yes. landscape scales and all and those are good and important uh, but at the end of the day if you want to prove something so proof of concept uh, is here you know in, but, but you've got landscape species like black bear which that. are migratory yeah so you know great. definitely the, even small patch yeah. conservation is also working it shows yeah. very well okay thank you i have thank to run thank you so much yes thanks a lot yes. for listening thank you thank you uh, and i'm very glad to hear that there's somebody on your group who's actually been to jabalpur so <laughs> that's great. that's great thanks thank you okay bye bye